most noble and illustrious drinkers, and you, thrice precious pockified blades. It's a good opening line, that, isn't it? The opening line to uh, Pan uh, Gargantua and Pantagruel. And he starts by saying, noble and illustrious drinkers, that's what we are. Welcome today. Right, I've got sort of an interesting mix today. The most important thing is this is a competition and you can win because you have to enter. You can't, you've got to be in it to win it. So what are you going to get? Now, the competition, we're doing this in association with SL Man. There's all the details below down here, but I'm going to tell you what's in it. Not least, you get six of these Richard Brendan Jancis Robinson glasses, which is why I want to enter, because I smashed one. So I've only got two, and I have three wines to try. So I'm going to have to enter it anyway, just to go and get hold of some glassware. You get uh, six glasses. Let me have a read it properly. It's a package of luxury wine accessories and wine up to a thousand... Well, it's a, worth about a thousand pounds. Get that. A thousand pounds. Um, so what, what are you going to get when you enter? You are going to have... A wine rack that's much more beautiful than mine. This is from Sorrel's Wine Racks, and it's a European redwood, and you get to choose the colour of stain. There are four colours available, and it's worth £437 for a beautiful wine rack, unlike this, which is worth Tutton's halfpenny, and it scratches the bottles. So you get a proper one that looks after your bottles from Sorrel's. You also get a passable sommelier wine knife in pistachio from Tanglewood Wine Accessories, Hello, all the team at Tanglewood. Uh, it's worth £195. I don't have a, a wine knife, corkscrew, worth £195. You'll be better and smarter than me. Well, you are anyway. Uh, you get £200 worth of glasses from Richard Brendan and Jancis Robinson. That's six of those. R they are really super. And you can use them in a dishwasher. And as we'll see today, they work for um, fortified wines, white wines, red wines and sparkling wines, they do for everything, you just need the one glass. And, do you remember a few weeks ago, we had wines from Cork, with two Ks, England's finest craft wines. Well, you get a case of those, £125 of those, uh, six wines from Cork, beautifully selected. This was one of the ones we had before, this is the uh, Oxney Estate Rosé, which we tried, and it's absolutely gorgeous. It's delicious, that. Um, so, at the end of this, I'll remind you, but go and get yourself down there, enter the competition with SL Man, and you get a £1,000 worth of wine and luxury wine accessories. Don't say we don't do anything for you. What wine are we going to try today? I'm going to start with this. This is a slightly surprising wine. This is Tio Pepe Enrama. These are sort of little bits that I've had to one side and haven't shown them to people yet. Now, this is 15.95 for this half bottle. I know that sounds like a lot. This is really special. This is the 2020, the 11th release of Enrama. Enrama, well, let's come back to it. You get this at Shaw's Iberian Wines, Amps, Soho Wine, Master of Malt, Whiskey Exchange, Uncorked, H2 Van, Flagship Wines, and various others. We'll put them down there. So this is Fino Sherry, okay? Bone dry Fino Sherry. And the way Fino is made, you get Palomino, this rather neutral grape, really. And you in near the town of Jerez. It grows on these is it albaritza soils, it's sort of white, unbelievably bright soils. And the wine is fortified and then it matures in these big barrels under a layer of what's called floor, which is this yeast, it looks like cream cheese across the top. And it draws out the glycerol, so you get this bone dry wine. And it matures in a solera, uh, which is a Spanish word for a school to gain all this complexity, but it's protected from oxygen by this layer of yeast. And then other sherries are available, we won't get into those just now. What happens is that the wine is then sort of blended and it's fined and filtered and it comes to us. Enrama is just bottled straight from the yeast. I think that's right. And so when we have a try, mm, it's kind of alive. It's there's got this extra vibrant layer about it. I mean, it's like Fino Sherry, which I adore. That saline tang, sort of, um, that sort of orange peel that comes in. There is an element of almond nuttiness about it. This citrus, piercing citrus zip. But Enrama has something more to it. There's, um, it, it, it is a slightly yeasty feel. There's a sort of yeasty richness about the wine. Um, it's got a glow, oh, 
and this ripeness. Actually, in a sense, it has more of a kind of ripe character than regular fino. It only comes out at this time of year, and you're meant to drink it quite quickly and soon. And yes, it is sort of more expensive, but it's something that you should go and try once. If you're a wine fan, you should go and try some Enrama. And, and try it maybe alongside a bottle of fino. The reason why you should have it in halves... Um, partly is because you want to keep it when it's absolutely at its best, when it's at this sort of really vibrant, first opened character. So you don't want the bottle sitting around. You want to drink that all in one go. And with my neighbours, we'll be drinking that all in one go because I'm going to go and disinfect it and hand it over the wall when I have other glass later on. That's really gorgeous stuff. Oh. Now, they don't make, make very much. Um, eighteen, Well, 18,000 bottles, um, but it doesn't av avail it's not available very long because it sells out around the world. And what you get, what does it say here? So it doesn't go through the standard processes of clarification and filtration. So it's at its purest, most natural state. Oh, it's beautiful. So it's just from 69 barrels and down from an initial selection of 196. That's beautiful. Get yourself into sherry. Now, because I've busted my glasses, actually, no, I'm going to leave that one because that will go and taint this. Some people have asked me about that. Going from sherry to a regular white wine, it will go and taint the, the next wine style. I met Philip Shaw, and I haven't tried his wines in Yonks. Philip Shaw, the dream of Yonye. About £16, pounds, this. £16, £17. Pounds. Today we've got quite luxurious wines because we're with SL Man, which means it's, it's a sort of luxury brand. So we've decided to have rather luxurious wines. I like a bit of luxury. On occasion, in moderation. So this is from Corks Out, the wine reserve, Field and Fawcett, General Wine Company and Australian Wines Online. And you can have affordable luxury. I mean, it's, you know, this is a sort of special once a week kind of wine, once every couple of weeks. Australian Viognier. I can't get enough of it. Um, Australia's probably done more than any other country in the world in how do you go and make Viognier into interesting, often not more vibrant styles of wine. When I first started in the trade, a very long time ago, Viognier had almost died out. There was, hardly, there was only a few football pitches a bit left. There's now quite a lot of it floating around, in part because of Australia. Let's have a try. It's, Viognier typically is peachy, but it's also got a sort of lychee fragrance when it's made like this. And people are making it in cooler sites, higher up. They're harvesting it earlier, so you're not getting that oily, waxy texture. Mmm. It has spent some time in oak, and Viognier does like oak. It's not an oaky wine. What it's done here is it's given it more interesting mouthfeel. This is a serious wine. If you're looking for Chardonnay with an exotic feel, that's Viognier. If you're looking for a kind of Riesling that's riper and a bit fatter and, and more citrusy, if you like, that's Viognier. That's the sort of direction that you go in. You should explore this. What does it say down here? Rose petal? Oh, yes. Now, this is quite innovative. And so the reason it's called the dreamer is because they're constantly questioning it. So what they do is they harvest it early. So you get lots of freshness, lower alcohol. They let it settle overnight. Um, it, they ferment it with solids. That means it gets more rounded mouthfeel and texture. Oh, that's beautiful. And it's got a little bit of sugar in it. I would not realised that when I first tried it. Seven grams per litre. Don't worry too much about what that means, but it does mean it's just noticeable. If it's around three, you don't really notice it. But seven grams per litre, you do just get this slight sweetness. Great with Asian cuisine. Actually, great, great with all sorts, but yeah, particularly Asian cuisine. Mm. Oh, I like that. That's my kind of thing. I remember going to Australia once, and um, they were doing a lot of experimentation with Viognier there and sort of how do you get the most out of it and a lot of it is about restraining it. that was the Australian guy who said it was like a, a an English public school boy he said it's lazy unless you kick him up the backside because they've got floppy hair for which he meant the canopy so you've got to trim it give it a short back and sides there you go ah now somebody has written it written in and particularly because we're giving away this passable sommelier wine knife very expensive 195 pounds thank you very much a couple of people have said, can you show us the correct way for opening a bottle? So I'm going to open this one properly, uh, rather than using my, uh, my little device, my Coravin. Here's the sort of tips. You, you've got your, your knife bit. I've got one of these corkscrews, sometimes called a pool tap. When I'm cutting it off, 
cut below the lip, not above it. Two reasons really. I don't think it looks neater, but also in the old days, you used to get um, lead salts that were quite poisonous that would build up here. And with the really old bottles, this allows you to sort of clean up the, this area here. It can sometimes get a bit mucky. You might have a little bit of um, slightly sort of sticky wine on it, so you can properly clean it up. So always cut it there. Now, a <laughs> this is a worm thread, okay? Not a gimlet screw which is the sort with a spike up the middle. So you want to have a corkscrew that looks like that, not one that's a spike with a blade around the edge. Get to the top. Now, actually, because the point is slightly off-centre, you should be slightly off-centre, and you push and twist. And very quickly, you want it to go down. Now, can you hear it? There's none of that. That's if it's going down the glass on the side. You want to avoid that, okay? It should be just going through the sort of soft corky bit. Now here I've got this two-step bit. Thumb, so that it comes straight up. Can you see it's coming straight up? My thumb is making sure that it comes straight up. If it doesn't, it starts, and that's when you get a cracked cork here. If you don't have your thumb there, you crack it halfway, and then you've got to go and do all sorts to get it out. You need a drill. Second stage. Now, if you're really smart, just before the end, Oh, just kisses, it comes out. So what is the wine? This is Brunello di Montalcino from Castellabanfi, 2015. This is 45 pounds. I've been here. I believe this is the largest contiguous vineyard in Europe, I think. It's, it's, it's one very big vineyard at the Castello, owned by an American family. So this is in Tuscany. This is still very young. To be honest, it's still got lots of vibrant fruit. Cherry, so there's lots of Sangio Sangiovese in there. And when I smell cherry, leather, tobacco, spice, oh, heady. It actually comes something quite savoury, it's quite meaty. There are two distinct styles of Brunello, certainly from my tasting. There's a very modern style and there's something that's much more traditional and earthy. Banffy, interestingly, tends to sit between the two. Whenever I've gone and done tastings, you get these ones that are quite much darker, rich fruit, glossy, um, in some ways possibly made to go to the United States, which is a market that tends to prefer that. And then you get other ones which can be much more restrained and they're drier, more Pinot-esque, I guess. So one veers towards Cabernet, the other veers perhaps a bit towards Pinot Noir. Banffy tends to sort of ride in between the two. Um, as an estate, I have found there's less vintage variation at, at Banffy. So if you're getting into Brunello, this is a great estate to begin with. It's, it's a significant estate. Then go off and try other people. It's a bit like that thing of, you know, how do you experiment with wine? You go sort of horizontally or vertically. So you go and try a Banffy like this, an estate like this, Banffy, and then try other Brunellos left and right of a similar vintage to see which style you like. Because this is probably roughly in the middle. That's my expectation. I've stayed there once or twice. It's really lovely. Oh, it is nice, actually. But it has got this core of cherry fruit. Now, this is going to last a long time. It's quite heady. Mm. Plenty of tannin, but they are fine tannins. Okay, so they will last a long time. Still got that fresh acidity, characteristic of the grape. Oh, that is good. Mm. It's like smoky. There is a tang to it. Mm. You know what you want to have with this? Um, ox cheek. You know, sort of long braised ox cheeks. I remember having that with, uh, with some of this. Oh, it was so good. Or a Fiorentina, which is one of those um, sort of Florentine steaks made from Canchina cows. I think they're called Canchina. Big white ones that you get up in the mountains. Um, that's beautiful. If you go to Florence, drop me a line. There's a restaurant run by a guy called Fatterini who plays the French horn. I don't know if it's related. We're all kind of probably related at some point. It's quite a lot of Fatterini's in Florence. There's this one and this, this guy. It's a very sort of local neighbourhood restaurant. You wouldn't find it unless you knew to go. But this bloke comes out and plays... I think he plays jazz on his French horn. But he's a very keen French horn player. Unusual instrument. You know, but his neighbours love him. But yeah, there are loads of Fatterini's in Florence. It's a beautiful city. I enjoy it very much. Best way to see Florence is go for a jog. 
because you get to see more of it than when you're than, than when you're sort of walking around. But you know, sort of an early morning jog, and there's so much to go and see that's just during the day, um, and far better than going and trying to be sort of taken around by other people. And then go and read it all up on Wikipedia when you get home. Oh, I like that. It says here, perfect as a meditation wine. I might have to go and meditate quietly. Right. What do I have to tell you all about? I've got a couple of questions. Hello, Wine Show. Looking forward to new shows. Message to Joe Fatterini. I You messaged me some time back. I'm sorry, I don't always get them all. Uh, you're starting a vineyard. Well, you've got the cuttings in the ground and you're on your way. You hope to have a, gl a glass of, you're called, a glass or two. You're called Stefan Hoisda. Hoisda? Stefan, I'd love to share a glass with you. I have only ever planted one grapevine and it died. But I did try to plant actually a Sangiovese vine in Yorkshire Dales. Doesn't work at all. So Stefan, wherever you are, I hope you have much more success. It's a serious challenge, but you are joining an 8,000 year old tradition to go and do that. Right, what's our next question? From Sandy. Sandy says, I'm working in Tbilisi. You lucky thing, I love Tbilisi, Georgia, uh, at the moment. And my boss wants to buy some cases of Georgian sparkling wine at a moderate price. Fair dues. She prefers dry wine. Lots of us do. Uh, the wines will be served to a wide variety of guests, including diplomats and government officials. This sounds like a, a challenging purchase that you've got to make. Can I recommend anybody or a sommelier or wine merchant to Tbilisi that I could arrange to contact? Thank you for your assistance, Sandy. Um, I'm not going to suggest any because I'm not having some diplomatic incident on my shoulders. Crumbs. It's been mad. Um, no, I'm going to recommend you go to 8,000 Vintages. Funny enough, I was just saying about 8,000 Vintages. There is a wine bar come wine merchants called 8,000 Vintages in Tbilisi. And it's brilliant. And it has this fabulous, very eclectic selection, but of sort of bigger producers and smaller ones, all different styles. The walls are covered about sort of 15 feet high with masses and masses of different wines. They're bound to have exactly the thing. And the really lovely guy in there, the menus have a sort of tasting guide on them. So you sort of tick the boxes on the menu, turn it over and it shows you how to taste the wine as you're working your way through. They're really, really clever. So go to 8,000 Vintages in Tbilisi. I don't know the name of the street, but there can only be one. But that's why it's called 8,000 Vintages, because that's how many they've made in Georgia. There you go. Right, get yourself onto this competition, because I really want you to go and have it. I want you to have a much nicer wine rack than me. Four colours, you can choose. Thank you very much indeed, Sorrels. I want you to have a nicer corkscrew. Wine knife than me. Thank you very much indeed, Tanglewood Wine Accessories. With some epic wines, in fairness, I do get these. So uh, get in touch with the guys from Cork, uh, 2Ks. They'll go and help you out with a beautiful case of six wines. And you get six Jancis Robinson glasses, Richard Brennan glasses, which is more than I have. Right, look after yourself, noble and illustrious wine drinkers. I'm going to see you again on Wednesday after you've entered that competition. Good luck and cheers.